you say the word spirit, it's like people get it, but also you don't hear it that often. And mm -hmm. it's certainly not used in a clinical setting. You are now you entering, entering. Preform. Prepare, Prepare to perform. To perform. A podcast created to explore the inner workings of high-profile performers. performers. Conversations reveal what separates them from the average human. Buckle up. Buckle up. Jamie Pabst is the founder and CEO of Spiritune a mobile application based on principles of music therapy and neuroscience to help people live happier, healthier, and more productive lives. Jamie founded Spiritune with the intention to harness the physiological power of music to improve the human. When music is tuned and personalized, it develops into an effective auditory tool for optimal performance, health, and well-being. So tune in to discover Jamie's journey through sound. I want to start with your relationship with sound. I was listening to another podcast you were on and I'd love for you to share with my listeners how you entered the world in such a unique situation. Um, sure, I am so happy to share this story. Um, so entering the world literally at birth, um, my mom became deaf when she was pregnant with me. Um, she found out she had a rare condition called autosclerosis, which is basically weakness in the inner ear bone, which can um, cause moderate to severe hearing loss when there's hormonal changes. So obviously giving birth is a drastic hormonal change in the body. And she happened to suffer severe hearing loss um, as a result. So I came into this world um, with a mom who, who, uh, happened to become deaf when, when she was in the process of uh, maternity. And, um, and so that gave me a very acute uh, appreciation for the sense of sound and what it means to our quality of life and our sense of well-being, just having the ability to hear. And then of course, how our auditory system works and how our body functions you know, from auditory stimuli. So I had you know, that special experience growing up with a mother with hearing loss um, to then appreciate the sense of sound in ways that I think the average person doesn't. Um, so that was kind of my early, um, very, very early foray into kind of appreciating the health aspects of sound. It's really interesting, Jamie. My brother went to Gallaudet University and studied sign language. He is now a sign language interpreter. I also studied deaf studies as my minor in undergrad, I wanted to ask you just as a quick sidebar, do you know any American Sign Language? Did your mom learn it when you were younger? Is it a part of the language in your household? Yeah, so she did um, She did start to learn sign language. I was still very young at that stage. Um, so I didn't, I didn't learn it um, mostly because my mom was lucky enough to have a surgery called a stapedectomy which is basically putting in a kind of a, an artificial um, inner ear bone, which did repair some of her hearing, but still just moderate. Um, but a lot of her hearing was able to be recovered through that surgery and also then using hearing aids. So she was lucky in that sense that she didn't live her entire life um, with hearing complete hearing loss. Um, however, she still struggles to this day with hearing, but at least she was able to recover enough hearing um, to not have to um, fully learn sign language. Um, although you do highlight a really important point, it did prompt her to actually start um, a career in education, um, uh, kind of in kind of uh, pursuing uh, education for the deaf, and oh, wow. actually. 
uh, it brought to light that there is actually significant uh, lack of resources with respect to education for mm -hmm. um, for the deaf and um, those with hearing loss. And so um, that was something that was really unfortunate because she she experienced you know real road roadblocks with respect to um, pursuing that endeavor. And so you know it wasn't something that sh that she could easily. Um, accomplish. Um, so she didn't end up going that route ultimately, but it did bring to light some of the lack of resources with respect to people, um, to deaf people. That's super interesting. So, I mean, at what point as an early child did music start to become such a big component of not only your life, but was it in the household? Did you get it outside of the household? Was it friends and family? I mean, your relationship with sound started before you got here and we're going to get into the platform in just a little bit, but take us through that transition from early childhood, growing up with a deaf mother until she was able to regain some hearing and then music starts to play a role. And as a sidebar, you're a DJ. So there's a whole nother level to this, but take us through a little bit that transition. Yeah. It's interesting as an adult, you kind of look back, and see those pivotal moments of your upbringing that had more of an impact than you think, right? Like right, I never yeah. would have thought as a child I would become a DJ, right? But now looking <laughs> back, it's like, that was, of course. it makes so much sense now, of course, that, that yeah. was gonna be my trajectory. But, um, but no, it, but uh, you know, music was a family affair from a fairly young age. Um, you know, starting with my sister and I both playing the piano and a lot of it actually happened in, um, elderly care facilities. Um, oh, wow. So I thought it was something my mom just, you know, had us do because it was ni a nice thing to do. But um, come to find out, you know, my sister, who's eight years older than me, she went on to pursue a degree in music therapy. And then it was then that I realized all of these neurological benefits that music mm -hmm. had as uh, a degree in music therapy uh, basically allows you to help treat people with neurological disorders such as PTSD, dementia, Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's um, in a more clinical setting. And a lot of music therapy happens in elderly care facilities. So little mm -hmm. did I know that as, you know, a young seven or eight year old playing the piano with my sister, I had my early experiences in music therapy. Um, so, so that's when my appreciation for sound really converted into music and how music can help us neurologically and physiologically. So let's talk a little bit about music therapy specifically for the listeners that have may have heard of that, no pun intended, or read about it somewhere. What is music therapy and how does it function within these clinical settings before we get outside of the clinical and into the non-clinical? What's going on neurologically? Yeah, so, uh, so music therapy is a field that's actually existed for quite some time, at least since around the, like the 1950s and 60s, when music therapists started to be employed by you know, hospital systems or kind of uh, in a clinical setting where um, you know, people who are licensed uh, um, can come in and help people um, with a variety of different uh, ailments, whether it's pain, um, uh, whether it's PTSD, dementia, Alzheimer's, like I just mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, there's so many applications of music um, where a music therapist can come in and help uh, a troubled patient in some manner, way, shape, or form. And, and it really is very specific um, with how the therapist works with each individual based on their condition. Um, even therapists are used significantly in um, the NICU to kind of help regulate um, underdeveloped children that are born um, because their breath rate and heart rate um, are, can be very unstable or kind of acutely waver back and forth based on different stimuli and they need to be regulated so, um, so significantly. And so there's really so many settings in a clinical setting that a therap music therapist can come in and treat a patient one-on-one -on -one based on their individual needs. Um, so, you know, we could spend a lot of time discussing kind of what are the different uh, types of, of things that they would do or instruments they would play, but basically they adapt 
their, you know, therapy or their music therapy to, um, based on the type of instrument they play, uh, the style with which they play for a specific outcome based on how this patient is feeling and what their um, ailment is. And so that's a lot of what we use to inform Spiritune, my work today in our application is what kind of instrumentation are we using or what are the musical qualities that can be adapted to meet somebody in their emotional state and then further evolve that music based on a listener's goal around kind of a state of focused attention, deep relaxation, sleep, et cetera. Ooh, this is incredible. So <laughs> before we get into spirit tune, at what point in your early childhood or even maybe it was high school or college, did you think to yourself, I want to develop something because you already alluded to your sister and you were playing piano and she went off got a music therapy degree, but at what point did you say to yourself, I want to develop technology that facilitates this process of music therapy and perhaps offer it to more than just clinical populations? Like when did, th when did this idea come to you? How did it come to you? Yeah, it was, wasn't until actually my professional career, although I will say in college, I did have my first moments when the pod, uh, the iPod was released. <laughs> that it was, awesome. I think, my fresh my freshman year of college. I think when the iPod really transformed the way we listen to music. Right. Absolutely. All of a sudden, we had a, like kind of a limitless um, uh, library of music at our fingertips mm -hmm. whenever we wanted. Um, and I remember the first time I ran, uh, like you know, to work out with my with my iPod and I ran like seven miles, which for me, like I'm not a runner or I used to not be a runner. So that was like the first indication of the power of, you know, technology or music at your fingertips right. to really transform performance or a state of mind. Um, but that was just, you know, a fleeting kind of moment of like, this is really cool that we now have this ability to transform the way we listen to music and where we listen to it. Um, but it wasn't until my career in finance in New York City where um, kind of it was around the 2008 financial crisis um, where it was an incredibly stressful time. I wasn't sure if I was going to lose my job, but, um, but we were really, you know, working to keep everything afloat. And it was, you know, I was still probably, I think, 24 years old, so not that, much, that long out of college. So I was kind of I was finding myself in... Uh, a lot of stressful moments and mm -hmm. um, feeling like that was my first indication of the lack of mental health support in the workplace. Um, there was nothing I could turn to um, that met me in the moments when my um, feelings of discomfort would surface. Um, and that was around the time then, you know, iPhones were available. And so apps, you know, became, I could turn to at least something right there in the moment um, where I felt that that was my aha moment of, well, I wonder now that music is so readily available in our mm -hmm. lives at the touch of our fingertips, can music be applied in different ways to treat the everyday person with feelings of stress and anxiety uh, with mental health support through music, um, through some of these principles I knew about through my sister's work in music therapy. Um, so that's kind of the aha moment where I was like, I started doing some research myself or looking up the research and then reaching out to some of the leading experts that were leading this research to kind of present the idea, see if it was possible, and then perhaps get them on board. And once they kind of validated the idea and said it was possible and that they'd be willing to work with me. That was kind of the, um, the tipping point for, for wanting to create something like this. That's awesome. So how did the name come about Spiritune? Yeah. So, um, so yeah, it's a good question. And I don't tell this story often. So Perfect. It, it took a while, but it was that moment. Once I found it, I was like, this is, this is perfect because spirit is something I think about. Uh, it's an underutilized term. I think that really encompasses our mind and body health. Mm -hmm. When we think about 
the spirit of somebody, you know, that's encompasses kind of their health when like if I say, you know, Ford, you have such a nice spirit, you know, or, or perhaps your spirit is less, you know, um, today feels a little bit, uh, a little bit lackluster, right? Mm -hmm. You know, spirit is one of those terms that we don't often use, but really encompasses somebody's kind of mind and body health. And then tune moving over to that part of uh, our brand name, um, tune obviously being, you know, music related, but also tune as far as far as like, you know, fine tuning um, our mind and body health, kind of thinking it as a, a tune up, right? Um, so kind of mm -hmm. a play on words there. So fitting spirit and tune, like you're tuning your spirit, your mind and body health was kind of perfect as far as um, a music mental health solution. I absolutely love it. Walk us through a little bit more about the messaging, the colors, just those brand assets and what the user can expect and maybe what's going on behind the scenes as to why you guys selected those specific colors, those fonts, like what is it that is happening more subliminally, obviously, but what's going on there with the messaging? Yeah, I, I love that you kind of went there and are diving into this area. I don't often talk about the visual component of Spiritune since it's mostly audio based, but mm -hmm. I was really focused on the design um, and kind of offering a therapeutic design, right? You know, it's, it is, the app is the way that it's delivered, the audio is delivered, but I felt like we could meet the listener in a therapeutic way every step of the way in the design. And so we did pay a lot of attention to the visual design to help assist the listener in their feelings. Um, and providing additional therapeutic support. So the visual component, at least um, kind of the color scheme and the gradient, right? It, uh, the, we use a gradient spectrum from blue, uh, which is a little more kind of soothing and um, kind of uh, down regulating, right? Um, and then moving into this warmer tone, which is kind of this peachy hue. I don't really have a, col a name for it, but I wanted it to feel, uh, you know, it, it kind of gives a little bit of a pinky peachy hue, but really, which is warm and inviting. However, I wanted it to feel very human-like. Um, mm -hmm. You know, obviously there's a spectrum of, of kind of human kind of skin colors that we couldn't necessarily encompass, but mm -hmm. we wanted to kind of it to have this human component and this warm um, kind of, uh, uh, feeling of like a humanizing color that kind of goes this uh, runs the spectrum of a gradient from kind of blue and soothing into kind of this warmer um, kind of peachy color and and then the gradient actually evolves um, I'm sure as you notice as the music um, evolves and transitions in emotion so if you do happen to be looking at the screen display it is kind of this therapeutic visual effect that assists you while you're having um, the kind of auditory experience. So I am well aware of the gradient shift, the concept of taking your brain and carrying it through this trajectory, but good chance my listeners have never heard this before, let alone have seen it before. So let's get into a quick demonstration just to break this down to showcase what a 10 minute experience would be like for a listener of Spiritune. Awesome. Let's get into it. The music played through Spiritune is best captured through the utilization of headphones. So before Jamie takes us through the demonstration, I recommend listening to the remainder of the episode with a pair of high quality headphones. All right, Jamie, go ahead and walk us through the start of Spiritune when we're asked, how are we feeling? Yeah, so when you open up the app, the first thing we want to prompt you as a listener is to ask you how you currently feel. And that's a really important thing because we want to encourage self-awareness and that tuning in of your emotional state, which is not something we as humans love to do. Uh, I think, you know, still, I think we're working on it as a society, but we're certainly not there yet. So even taking a few seconds out of your day to tune in and really think about how you're feeling promotes a self-awareness that is really powerful with respect to, um, you know, 
getting to a better place. Um, whether you're in a positive place or a negative place, just self-awareness is really the first step towards taking control over your emotions. So that's the first thing we ask you um, when you open up the Spiritune app. And so how you're feeling ranges from uh, a variety of different core emotions. So we kind of start you off with four different core emotions uh, running from low to high arousal to negative to positive valence. And I know mm -hmm. those are kind of perhaps not everyday terms, but essentially that takes you from core emotions ranging from chill to lethargic to anxious to energetic. And around these core emotions, you see these kind of sub emotions that are associated um, with each core emotion kind of pop out. Um, so this is to encourage kind of you to take that self introspection and kind of tune in to one of the feelings that you're uh, that have surfaced in this current moment. So, so let's see, how do we feel uh, in the spirit of this tutorial? Shall we start us off? I think a lot of us are still feeling kind of uh, pandemic anxieties. Should we, should we start with anxious? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. So then we're going to move into how you would like to feel. Hmm. So um, no matter how you're currently feeling, we want to meet you there because every emotion is valid and we want to embrace, embrace and meet you where you are. But then we also want to shift you towards where you would like to go. And hopefully that's in a positive state. So we leave you with uh, two options, which are on the kind of positive valence side of things, which is energetic, uh, running to the spectrum, through the spectrum towards chill. So um, how about we choose not only chill, but let's choose a sub emotion of content. How do you feel about that? That's perfect. I'm looking forward to this. Awesome. So just to give you a quick, another kind of side comment, Spiritune is all about um, transitions. Um, you know, we also have the option of maintaining you and stabilizing you where you are, but it's all about this kind of, this is a music therapy principle called the ISO principle. And it's um, basically, uh, it states that to transit, to have a therapeutic effect, you really want to meet somebody where they are before you transition them to a different place. And so that's what Spiritune is, uh, it's, it's core to one of uh, Spiritune's design and composition methodologies. So, so we are moving from a state of anxious to content is what we selected. And then lastly, we want to know what you are doing, like what is your goal or what is your activity that you're currently doing so we can further optimize or adapt your track to meet you where you are and help you accomplish your goal. So that ranges from workflow, winding down, sleep, and also waking up. So that kind of encompasses a large amount of your day, right? Mm -hmm. um, to give you some tracks that will help you in every moment. Um, Let's see, we're sitting around 2.45 p.m. Eastern, so we're still in the middle of the workday. Should we choose workflow? Yeah, let's not choose sleep. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's, let's stay in the workflow scape. All right, perfect. Okay, so with that, that's it. It's very simple. We want to choose, we want to select where you are, where you want to be to transition you into, uh, you know, that emotional state and then further optimized around your goal or your activity. So three things at play, and then we're going to take you away with a track. Um, so you ready to hit play? Absolutely. Okay. So here we go. Let's tune in.
Wow. How do you feel? Well, I turned off the headlights and got out of the chair. And in the beginning, as you mentioned, meeting me where I was, feeling a little tight, maybe a little anxious from all of the stuff that I've done this past few days, stuff still on the to-do list. And then I found myself settling back into my chair while still keeping the lights off and feeling, as you mentioned, that trajectory shift all the way down to a chill space and yet a focused and concentrated workspace. So I feel locked in, needless to say, and definitely awesome. interested in, in learning more from your side as to what I just experienced and you're referencing carrying me to a new space. What was going on there? Great. Well, you explained it perfectly. And that's the effect, you know, that we're, we're aiming for with each and every composition. Uh, well, the effect personalized, obviously. Um, right. But yeah, what happened there was, you know, if you noticed in the beginning, there were kind of the, the musical elements were, you know, almost a bit unsettling, right? Mm -hmm. um, it actually, and that is not, you know, that's not common, right? In a musical composition, you want it, most uh, people are shooting for something pleasing all the time, right? But, um, but there's kind of this element of, of kind of um, sporadicness and, and angst in these kind of unsettling tonalities and kind of sporadicness of el musical elements peppered in for kind of the per first zero to 30 seconds. Um, so the idea here is that we're meeting you where you are. You chose to uh, chose up that your current state was anxious. So the idea is that we're embracing you where you are. We're meeting you where you are and helping you kind of feel immersed in that, in that feeling because everyone has states of anxiety, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's not a bad thing. That is something that makes us human. Right. And so we should be embracing it. We shouldn't be forcing it away. So we embrace you where you are musically, but we don't want to support that forever, right? So, so we try to release and resolve that feeling of anxiety as we change the musical tonalities, uh, complexities, and evolve the track into your desired state, which in this case we chose you know, a chill sort of content state um, around a, uh, a state of focused attention for work. Um, so what happened was that, you know, those feelings, uh, or that kind of the sound qualities of anxiety dissipated within kind of 20 to 30 seconds and then evolved into, uh, you know, for lack of a more scientific word, uh, a more chill place mm -hmm. as then kind of was supported by this kind of rhythm or tempo or pulse in the track. Um, you know, typically when we think of going to a chill state, we think of a very ambient down tempo state, but when we think about focused attention, because we chose uh, the workflow category, we still want to give you enough musical stimulation or auditory stimulation to kind of keep your brain firing, right? And still supporting uh, with enough auditory stimuli to keep you in enough of a uh, aroused level to kind of support uh, a state of focused attention. So. In this particular track, um, we kind of evolved the musical qualities to, to help you kind of feel a little more uh, down-regulated, but still mm -hmm. with enough energy to support a state of focused attention. Um, I could dive more into the, the musical elements of that if you'd like, but it, it could, take, could take some time. So <laughs> that's my best high-level overview for you. Cool, so I'm gonna try my best bringing this thing back to my first question for you and your relationship with sound. And then you mentioned the NICU and how music therapy is utilized for pre premature and undeveloped infants in the first few days, first few weeks of their life. Let's talk a little bit about the lows in the music itself, specifically with the track that we just listened to. When I hear those sounds, I immediately think of the heartbeat and that very rhythmic, very low in frequency, low in hurt sound, not even music, just sound in that space to where it brings me back to a very, very early stage of my life. And it's 
obviously subconscious, right? We're not necessarily aware of what's happening the first few days. But the first sound that a mother hears is their child's heartbeat before they're even, and feels before they're even entered into the, the world physically. So let's unpack a little bit more. And I know we could talk music for hours, but what's going on with the lows? Why is that so important within the Spirit Tune app? Yeah, so rhythm is very primal, very primitive. Mm -hmm. um, as you mentioned, it's the first thing we hear in our in the womb, and it is you know rhythm is something that is essential to life. Uh, our whole body is made up of rhythmic functioning, our breath rate, our heart rate. So we're naturally conditioned. You know, Mother Nature is is a beautiful creator, right? She, she knows what's going on. Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> so it's the same with music. You know, rhythm is the number one feature set in a musical uh, composition that we're looking towards to guide um, our, the physiological response. Mm -hmm. So a lot of our stress response, in fact, you know, the definition of our stress response is, is our, our breath rate and our heart rate. Um, and music has a fundamental power to modulate our breath rate and our heart rate. Um, and so that, you know, whether it's for, you know, us adults or whether it's for a child where it becomes really important uh, to their, um, to an undeveloped, underdeveloped child in the NICU, breath rate and heart rate is something that's so critical into helping them develop and get to a healthier place because their breath rate and their heart rate, those responses are critical um, you know, when, when they don't have the ability to self-soothe themselves. So everything uh, in, the, in the world outside of the womb is traumatizing to them. Mm -hmm. right. so their, their heart rate and breath rate can be all over the place. And really you want to help them stay regulated. And so music can be such a great force in that, in that initiative and in that endeavor. In fact, we're working on a lullaby project right now for Syrian children, refugees, um, to help, uh, you know, support them with feelings of comfort. And so we've been wow. talking about the qualities, the low end, how that's so important um, in a lullaby, um, because, you know, the low end, the low spectrum, the low frequency sounds tend to be more soothing and stabilizing. Higher frequency sounds are more, uh, are more arousing and heightening mm -hmm. our senses. Um, that's a very primal thing, right? You know, when you think of, of a, a lion roar or a bird squawking, that's like, you know, that arouses us to sense, to hear danger, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, what, and then therefore our, our stress response goes into play. Um, so, you know, bringing it back, um, again, the, those kind of low end frequencies help kind of support and stabilize, um, with kind of a pulse that it's something we can, uh, latch onto really, and that our breath rate and our heart rate naturally respond to subconsciously. Um, and that's actually a, a very well-researched scientific principle called entrainment. Hmm. And music we are has definitely the unique speaking the capacity same. to um, uh, to drive entrainment. Yeah, we're we're speaking the same language here. This is super interesting. When you're talking about the physiological response of breath and heart rate, entrainment within the nervous system. You touched on a little bit this new lullaby project. And one of my overarching questions for you, as founder and CEO of this platform, what's your vision? Where is Spirit Tune gonna be? Let's say five years or perhaps even a decade down the road? What is your grand vision and mission for what this platform can have to offer? It's a great question. Um, it is one that I, I visualize a lot. And, you know, when I think of music's highest power, you know, it's, you know, the ability to use music on a deeper level. And that's, you know, mm. you know we could call it music as medicine, right? Or music, uh, music to heal, right? Um, you know, when we think about the, you know, music has always actually since the beginning of time been used more for health purposes. It was really just more modern day kind of westernized uh, <laughs> kind of marketing socialization that really kind of 
categorize music into this entertainment world, but really it's mm -hmm. always been about health and healing. And so to kind of reimagine music back to its fundamental purpose and ability to help people live and thrive uh, and be touched by the power of music in a more reliable way, um, more than just entertainment. Like I imagine a world where doctors can prescribe music or spiritune rather than drugs and pharmaceuticals, uh, because that is a unique capacity that music has. Um, we just haven't gotten there quite yet as a society and as, you know, it does need to be more you know, regulated, more research, of course, um, but, you know, we're doing our, our small part uh, and kicking things, uh, you know, kind of evolving, evolving things um, to a place where hopefully this can happen. Well, it's definitely a positive pebble in the pond, you know, and it's encouraging to hear a founder and CEO like yourself that's on a mission to heal, that healing is a 24-7, 365 process. It doesn't happen by consuming 30 days of a prescription, you know, and I think people are starting to understand that more and more and be okay with leaning in and looking for holistic remedies that in conjunction with other sources of healing practices can really make an impact for them for the longevity of their time here on the planet. As we know, we're not here very long. We're kind of like the wind, you know, we blow in, we blow out. So it really is an empowering place to be in. I can't wait to see where this thing goes, really. I mean, it's, I know you're in the early stages of it and it's already so exciting and so rewarding. I can already tell from your point of view and to see that return on your own investment. I tip my hat to that because it's, it's a lot of work behind the scenes for this to come to fruition. So again, I just want to thank you for taking the time to share your journey, share your platform and share your vision for the future of Spiritune. Thank you so much for it. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you for inviting me to come on as a guest and share the Spiritune story and my personal story. And, you know, my big hope for Spiritune is a current little pebble that hopefully will make a big ripple effect. <laughs> a giant wave. <laughs> a giant wave. Okay. That's even Then better. we can all ride it, right? Then we can all totally. ride that, that wave, that energy. So it's Amen. exciting stuff. Love that. Um, yeah, it's, um, you know, when you're a small, when you're a startup, you have to stay focused and, you know, start with where you, where you can, but we certainly have a big vision and we hope that, you know, uh, we can evolve and, and uh, achieve that big vision. So, um, so thank you again for, for having, having me on and allowing me to tell my story. Wonderful. My pleasure. I know my listeners are going to enjoy it as well. So thank you again for coming by. Of course. Are you ready to optimize? Perform Humans is the evidence-based approach to optimal performance, health, and well-being. The platform collaborates globally with a variety of high-profile performers, corporate executives, elite athletes, first responders, and military personnel. Perform Humans offers private consultation and live webinars designed for individuals, small groups, and large audiences. Visit perforhumans.com for more information.